Tokipod is a premier hub providing supreme quality, completely free podcasts and audiobooks, amassing myriad enthusiastic followers across high-traffic platforms like SoundCloud, Facebook, and YouTube. Boasting an ever-expanding library with thousands of titles spanning sought after genres from fiction to horror, true crime to history, this vast catalog cements Tokipod's reputation as an elite one-stop venue for riveting listening. Meticulously crafted recordings continue attracting millions globally across languages and demographics. Visit and subscribe to stay instantly updated on our newest released audiobooks and picked to cater to all preferences. We guarantee captivating editions for every taste awaits at your fingertips. Join our burgeoning international community immersed in our critically acclaimed creations. Premium entertainment awaits any seeker of knowledge or thrilling escape. Part 27 Jace! No response. Jace? Still no response. Yo, Jace! In a groggy, only half-listening kind of voice, he answered, What? Finally. That fire is spreading pretty fast. Good. I sighed, beginning to get concerned. Earth to Jace. That tree is now on fire and it might fall over. If the tree falls over, it is going to be on fire. If it falls over on fire, then the fire might jump that big ditch thingy over there. From that point, there is nothing to stop the fire from running all the way to the road. You know, that flat concrete path through the forest and hills where we need to drive the truck and trailer? Jace was still staring at the flames when suddenly he stiffened and looked at me. Damn it! If the fire crosses the gully! Partially coming out of his daze, he snapped. We have to get out of here, and right now! Hadn't I just said the same dingity-dang thing? For someone that is supposed to be older than me, and going to teach me things, Jace was acting like he'd been hit in the head really hard. More than once or twice, he started running and pulling me along with him. If I had locked my knees, I would have just skied along. The leaves on top of the path we were using were damp and slippery from the recent rain, and were perfect for sliding. But the leaves underneath were very dry. In fact, there were a lot of dry things for the fire to burn now that the sun and cold and low humidity had sucked the moisture from everything again. An hour later, the smoke from the fire was still visible, which meant that the fire had definitely grown. When the wind blew from that direction, you could even smell it. Jay said, We aren't stopping until we cross the state line. That was a change in plans. Wait, I thought you said you didn't want to do Rockford at night. If we don't stop until we get into Wisconsin, that's exactly what is going to happen. I know what I said, but I changed my mind. Why? He slammed on the brakes so hard the trailer fish tailed. I told you. He turned to look at me, and I had my big screwdriver up and ready, which shut him up. Don't scream and yell, I told him quietly, using the tone of voice that Sherry did right before she would slap the bejeebers out of me. Just because you are in the driver's seat doesn't mean I don't have a right to ask which way you are driving. I want to know why you changed your mind. I'm beginning to wonder if... Don't, he said quietly. I... Look, I'm just not used to somebody asking me why all the time and... And I've never had to explain things before. It's irritating, and I don't have a lot of patience right now. Clary never did. And as cracked as Sammy was, she didn't ask why as much as you do, either. I don't care. I'm not your crazy cousin, and I'm not your dead girlfriend, I told him in a voice that told him just how dangerous my not caring could be. You lay one hand on me, even try it, and I'll do whatever I have to to make you stop. In fact, just let me out here and give me my pack. This isn't working. Dee Dee, I... Say it or not, I don't care whether you're sorry. I lived a full year being stomped on by people. I'm tired of it. Rather than stop, he put the truck in gear and started driving again. I growled, I said, let me out. He shook his head and kept driving anyway. No. Just because I acted like a jerk is no reason for you to get stupid. He was quiet for a minute while I contemplated how badly hurt I would be if I jumped from a moving vehicle. He must have sensed it because he hit the electric and childproof lock button. 
I turned to give him a warning look when he started talking again. The reason why is that I've been thinking about our route. We picked the fastest way, which is straight up the interstate. When I was still in Springfield, we heard radio reports about how the military concentrated on clearing the interstates and major highways so they could move large convoys around more easily. So I'm pretty sure we aren't going to hit road blockages or anything like that, unless it is something that has happened in the last six months. But I was looking at the map last night, and there are too many larger towns and cities along that route. We need to move through quickly, and since we've got the clear roads, we might as well take plenty of advantage of them. But Rockford! I know. It will be the biggest of them. The interstate skirts the city, and if... When? We get around Rockford, then the state line and Beloit are just a hop, skip, and a jump beyond that. We've got plenty of gas in the trailer. Or at least plenty enough to get close to singing waters. What we don't know about is the weather. We need to take advantage of decent weather while we have it. Right now it is looking fairly okay. Tomorrow might be a different story. October weather this far north can be changeable. I looked in Uncle Simon's almanacs, and the average temp in south Wisconsin is 50s and 60s during the day and 30s and 40s at night. That's good weather. On the other hand, where you want to go is way north of there in the Nicolay National Forest. You know how cold it is going to get there? We need to get there soonest and get you set up. I let him continue to ramble. What I hate is when he is constantly saying things like, where you want to go, where we need to get you set up. It isn't like I'm looking for company or anything, but he said he'd be around long enough to teach me how to do things that I need to do. By always talking about me, never about himself as part of it, it makes me wonder just what is going on in his head. Part 28 So much for making it through Rockford, Jay snapped while he threw the tire iron back into the truck. I kept my mouth shut. I could literally see the steam coming off his skin where the hot sweat met the cool afternoon air. And his eyes looked a whole lot like they had that first day I'd accidentally entered his world. Jace snarled, Get in the truck! I got in the truck but hid my screwdriver within easy reach. Something very, very wrong was going on in Jace's head. Doc might have called it something like PTSD. I'm not sure. He said a lot of people in the city were suffering from it because of the mental and physical trauma and deprivations we were all dealing with. Moses just called it getting crazy. Having the crazies isn't necessarily a deal-breaker as far as getting a lift from Jace to where I want to go, but it definitely makes me more careful. So long as what he says and what he does mostly mesh, we'll be fine, even if he gets a little crazy. But when he starts saying one thing and doing another, I'm going to move on all on my lonesome, and he can go take his crazies someplace else. Besides, I don't even think Dad would have been happy to have had to change three tires in one day. The first two were on the truck, and we had them. Jace drives me nuts, saying things like, Two is one and one is none. But I think I'm beginning to be a believer. What that means, according to Jace, is, Redundancy is key to survival. In other words, not just having one extra of something, but having several extras of everything. <clears throat> Don't know if I would go that far, but it sure doesn't look like it hurts any at all. The third tire was on the trailer, and we had to plug and refill that one with that canned foam junk, but to do it, we had to take it off, which was so not fun. Jace wasn't the only one with racked knuckles that time. We finally got to a place where we could pull off the interstate, called HY-38, and tried to get some rest. Before we went to sleep, Jace insisted on discussing the day's progress. He started, Look, uh, about earlier, Sue, forget it. You cracked your knuckles a couple of times. Guys don't like that kind of stuff, I told him, trying to distance myself from him. Sherry had warned me about guys that apologize all the time. If they were really sorry, she said, they wouldn't have to apologize more than once or twice instead of going back and doing the same thing over and over. He gave me a searching look, but I refused to look back. 
You don't believe me, do you? he said. Problem was, his tone said his feelings were more hurt about me not believing him than they were about how he'd acted in the first place to get me that way. I shrugged. I don't know you. How should I know whether you act like this all the time or just when you get stressed out? How do I know your apology is worth anything? That's harsh. I shrugged again. So's life. He looked like he wanted to get mad, but then he shrugged his own shoulders. True. And that's what we need to talk about. Lesson time? Yes and no. Let's call this preschool and see how fast you graduate. Part 29 Oh, goody, I like school, I told him in a lispy little girl voice, then snorted and stuck my tongue out at him. It made him smile. It was a small smile, but at least it was real, and the corners of his mouth turned up a little. He asked, oh, Okay, what did you notice when we got off the interstate? I looked at him and wondered just what he was asking about. You mean, what did I see, Atina Sonel? Start with that. Start with that, he says. Hmm, okay, the road was clear like you said it would be. There's been a few wrecks along the road, but they looked like they had been pushed to the side even if they happened in the middle. Good. What else? Those signs, they looked... I don't know. They weren't just homemade and junk. They looked like someone that knew how to make signs made them. Like they were real signs, and not something someone just used spray paint and cardboard to make. That's right. What did the sign say? Different things. Stay away from X, Y, and Z. Where evacuation points were. Prepare to stop for inspection, and if you don't stop, expect to get shot. Jace nodded. Okay, what about when we got off? You mean that this exit ramp was harder to get off on compared to some of the other ones? We had to push that car out of the way to get past and under the overpass. The highway looks kinda all tore up too. Jace nodded again, this time with some approval that made me feel better, even if I didn't really want to fall into that trap. Good eye. So what do you think it means? What do you mean, what does it mean? How am I supposed to know that? It isn't like they've hung a sign explaining it all. He flicked a piece of gravel at me. Don't act stupid, Dee Dee. Go back to how you survived in the city. You'd see something and it would be a clue that told you something could be around the corner, or what happened, or whatever. I didn't want to tell him in the city I was used to other people thinking about that stuff for me, so I tried to put the two and two together that he had handed me. The military, or someone like the military, uses these roads, or did for a while, up to six months ago anyway when you had to leave the radio at Springfield. Jace nodded. Now those signs tell us that at least for a while someone was patrolling the roads too because they were stopping people like they had the authority to do it. A couple of those wrecks might be where people didn't want to be stopped and whoever did what they said they were going to do, which was shoot. But I don't think they were total scumbags about it because there are plenty of warning signs, I said. They also give places to stay away from and it looks like some of the place names would get added to whatever the sign said when it was first put up. Some of the evacuation points were X'd out so they didn't get people's hopes up or kept some information going current. Some of the exit ramps were also destroyed with warning signs saying that it was dangerous to enter that area. Jace flicked another piece of gravel at me, but this time it was with approval. I guess it was a guy thing. Good catch on how they are, we're adding names to the list of dangerous places. Which leads us to here. The exit ramp. It isn't clear, but it doesn't look intentionally blocked, does it? Not on purpose, no. But the cars have been here a while. The cars are covered with dust and debris, and so are the scorch marks where that truck caught fire that we tried to move but could concern it. Which kinda goes against the rest of the wrecks and ramps. Beginning to see it, I said, You mean that whoever they is, for some reason, isn't taking care of things anymore? Or at least not in this immediate area for a while. 
You probably didn't hear much where you were, but the military did a lot of what they called pulling back. It is like they were, um, consolidating their positions. That's a term they used a low tea. A formerly secure site would fall, and they would pull back and reorganize, tighten up their defensive lines. Sometimes that meant abandoning evacuation points, towns, and other strategic locations. Sounded like a real mess when you were listening, and there was a lot of armchair quarterbacking by people in my group. The professors were always trying to outguess what the military and government would do next and complain and criticize it. Thinking about it, I told him, this doesn't look like a mess, not like some of the messes that I've seen. This just looks, I don't know, forgotten, like it is a place that doesn't matter enough anymore to bother with it. Jace nodded slowly. Good way of describing it. He gave me a closed look and said, I know I bitched. Geez, that look could scare an infected. Fine, I won't swear. Geez, you're picky. Anyway, I know I complained about not making the state line earlier, so this is going to sound pretty crazy. I want to check out that town down the highway. Rochelle, or whatever it's called. I want to see what kind of condition it is in. I gave it two seconds of thought before looking right at him and saying, Why? He knew I was picking at him because of his earlier complaints about me asking too many questions. He rolled his eyes but responded, Because the shape it is in will give us some more clues. Might also see if there are some tires for the truck. Kill two birds with one stone. Fine. After a moment, I added, Is that the last of preschool? Because I gotta tell you, I don't feel like I'm getting that educated. He snorted. No, that's not all for tonight, but I wanted to see how fast you got a concept. What concept? It is called situational awareness. It's something you need to have whether you are in immediate danger or not. That means getting clues from what you see, and sometimes what you don't see. You mean like missing pieces of a puzzle? Yep. And since you seem to at least understand that I want you to make sure you practice it. It's important, Dee Dee. You ask why so much. Well, what if someone isn't there to answer your question? I nodded, understanding what he meant. You mean if I just shut up and watch and listen and look for clues, uh, I might be able to answer the question before I have to ask it? Yeah, exactly. It's not that that you shouldn't ask questions, it's just that you ask so many, and half of them you wouldn't have to if you just take a few moments to think for yourself. My feelings wanted to get hurt, but since Jace wasn't the first person to point that out to me, Toddy used to say roughly the same thing. I tried to just accept it. Thinking about it, I do realize that getting stuff from books like I used to was fine as far as it goes, but there isn't exactly a manual on how to survive what the world has turned into, or at least I haven't found one yet. I'd been depending on other people. I'd even kind of been looking forward to going back to my old life, until I finally accepted that my old life was gone forever, and so were most of the people from it. Then I accepted Jace's promise to teach me stuff, so I could depend on myself for real. But if I am going to do this, I need to do it right. Earth to Dee Dee. I looked at Jace. I was thinking. Didn't look pleasant. Wasn't, but that's life, so what's next, teacher? Part 30. Planning? Planning what? I asked Jace. Everything. You have to have a plan before you need one. And for everything, you will eventually need a plan. Out of the blue, he shoots a question at me. What are the basic elements of survival? What? Huh? When he just looked at me, I put my brain in gear and slowly answered, Water? Shelter? Food? In a really stupid fake voice, Jace said, Very good grasshopper. Toddy used to do the same thing, and I hated it then, too. Oh, shut up! He bowed from his waist while sitting on a camp stool. He looked like a dork, but it still made me smile even while it brought back memories I would rather not have thought of. 
getting serious again, he said, There are actually more elements than that, but those are the most important. You can't live without food and water, and in many cases, you can't live without some kind of shelter either. The most important, of course, is water. I started ticking off what I'd already learned. Canteen, filter. Buckets to catch rain and snow, something to boil water in. Bleach, those little pill thingies you pack that decontaminate the water. And at the cabin there is a well house with two hand pumps in it for potable water. Know what potable water is? I rolled my eyes. I'm not a complete know-nothing. Potable means you can drink it, cook with it, and that sort of thing. I also know how to prime the well. I learned how from the people that ran singing water. There was this old guy named Mr. Svensson. He was some kind of uncle or something like that to the people that ran the place. And he used to like my questions because it gave him somebody to talk to. Mom didn't mind because it kept me out of trouble. Toddy didn't mind because it meant he didn't have to babysit me all the time. Dad didn't mind because he said I talked so much I ran the fish off. He snorted and said, I can see that. You want to cook from here on out? No, but that's a good enough segue into the next survival element, and that is food. This one is going to be harder. No kidding, I said sarcastically. First lesson I learned in the city was how important food was, and that no one was just going to give it to you for no reason. You have to fight for your share. Uh, well, maybe not quite that where you want to go, but you are going to have to be real serious about finding and preserving your food, so you'll have some on days you don't find any new stuff. We've got a lot in the truck and trailer, but we still have a long ways to go, and we are eating up more than we are adding to the supplies. That's another reason I want to check out that town. Any little bit that we can add back in is going to make it easier to give you time to figure things out once you get settled in at the cabin. He was doing that you thing again, and it was still just as irritating as the first time he'd done it. I let it go, but just barely. I didn't want to sour his disposition again. Or at least that's what Mom would have called it. I know how to fish. I did it plenty every summer. Did you catch anything? Sure. Every time? Of course not. That's not how fishing works. Well, at least you're honest. Smarty Pants, I can also bait my hook and clean my catch. Dad made me learn how. He said it wasn't fair to expect him and Mom to do everything if I was going to eat it. Well, he said surprised. Count me impressed. Maybe this won't be as hard as I thought it would be. Thanks a lot, I told him three quarters, disgusted that he was acting like such a guy. No, seriously, this really isn't going to be bad. I've got more to work with than I thought. Well, doesn't he know how to flatter a girl? All right already. We both agree I'm not a complete doofus in the food department. Guess what? I can also make and bake bread, garden a real vegetable garden, and clean and cook chickens, so there. Slowly he asked, Seriously? Yeah, seriously. Mom didn't work, which meant the only paycheck was the one Dad brought in. We lived in a little house with a little money. Mom did what she had to so that Dad wouldn't feel like a little man. She figured one day I might get married, so she taught me the way her mom taught her. Wow. Yeah, so what else? I asked, suddenly depressed. He nodded. Well, you can fish, but can you hunt? Uh, uh, no. Well, at least I have something to teach you. There will be time to get into more details, but since you've already said you can't hit the broadside of a barn, I think we'll start with snares and traps as opposed to a gun or bow. When we get where we're going, I'll look around and see what kind of wild foods there are to forage. There won't be much this late in the year, but I'll try and mark off areas that might be worth something come spring. Now for the last thing. Shelter. Part 31. You've told me a little bit about singing waters, but I want you to see it in your mind's eye and really describe it for me this time. Seriously? I asked him. 
since it sounded kind of stupid the way he said it. Yeah, see it and think about the place in relation to water, food, and shelter. I sighed and felt kind of dumb, but decided to try it his way. Okay, the place isn't really big. I mean, the National Forest is big, of course, but the campground is only like about 40 acres from the entrance gate to the lake. The only fence is up near the gravel road where you come in at. After that, it is all open and stuff, but there are boundary markers to tell you when you've left the campground and walked into the USS land. Dad's been, had been stuck a date and going there since he was a boy, and the cabins have been in the same family all that time. It is some kind of leftover something or other from pioneer days back before there was such a thing as a national forest. Actually, it used to be a logging camp in the beginning, then it was some kind of hunting club thing, and then the owners started getting families in back around the early 1900s, so they converted it to a kind of tourist place. There were more cabins when Dad was a kid, but a fire that happened right before Mom and Dad got married burned down half of them. The family took the insurance money and refurbished the remaining cabins, built a nice well house, built chamber toilets onto each cabin, and added a central dining hall where they would have cookouts and stuff a couple of times a week, and where you could get the kind of junk food campers sometimes buy. That freeze-dried stuff that tastes like used matches. Last time we were up there, they were in the middle of adding outdoor showers to the cabins, too, but I don't know if they ever finished them. They'd built solar cisterns, some green energy project a grandson was doing his doctoral thesis on. Dad said Benji, the grandson of Mr. Svensson, was a hippie wannabe and didn't like me going near him because he said his friends felt a little off to his spidey senses. Jace had a look on his face like I'd given him a whole lot more information that he wanted or needed. I guess I do kind of talk a lot once I get going. He was a good sport, though, and didn't say anything except to ask, How close are the cabins to the woods? To the lake? Trying to ease back a little on the carbon dioxide I was expelling, I told him, Closer to the woods than the lake, though you can see the dock from every cabin's porch. Animals? What? You mean, like, pets? No, no pets allowed. Forest animals. Yeah, kinda, I guess. It depended on how many cabins were rented out, and how many people were hanging out on the lake, and if everyone remembered to pick up their trash the right way. He got it in one. You mean bears? I nodded. Yeah. Not so much when we were there in the summer, but the owners said they could be a problem later in the season. They closed the cabins down by the end of October. He got a concerned look on his face. Describe the cabins. Why? Because I need to know if these cabins are even set up for winter. Oh, gotcha, I said, understanding what he meant. A lot of the cabins around the lake are just frame and stuff, but the cabins at Singing Waters are the real deal. They are made of real whole logs, not just split wood frame. They used to rent them out for ice fishing and cross-country skiing when I was little, but they stopped that the year I started middle school. The owners said they just didn't want to bother hiring someone to stay up there year-round when it was easier and cheaper to hire college kids to do it for the summer alone. After Labor Day, it was only Mr. Svensson and his wife that stayed up there, and he said they were thinking about shortening the season even more because of Mr. Svensson's arthritis. Well, that's a relief. About the cabin walls, anyway. Can you remember what kind of roofs they have? Sure. Insulated metal roofs. The owners were real big on fire prevention and stuff. Each cabin had fire extinguishers, smoke alarms, and carbon monoxide alarms because of the wood stoves. Every night program they put on there were presentations about fire safety. Once a week they would have a real forestry ranger come and do a Smokey the Bear kind of thing for the little kids. In fact, if you were a kid and learned all the rules and some other nature stuff while you were there, you got a little something from the gift shop as a prize. Usually it was a mini compass, magnifying glass, or some other thing with the camp logo on it. 
Mom called it free advertising and was always telling me that if she found it just lying around, she would throw it away as junk. I have a whole box of those little things. Looking surprised, he said, Have? You don't mean that's what is in that old raggedy bag you wouldn't let me look in? I shrugged. None your bees wax what is in that bag. A girl has to have some secrets. I also keep this notebook in that old raggedy bag, and he doesn't need to know that either. He doesn't need to know about my personal stash of girl stuff, for that matter. Okay, whatever, he said, rolling his eyes. What about the kitchen? Well, there isn't a kitchen. Before he could say something snotty, I told him. You can sort of kind of cook on the Franklin wood stove. My folks heated their coffee up that way, or Mom would boil water for oatmeal. But the main cooking was done outside in the fire ring or on the grill thingy. And Mom used to bake biscuits in a reflector oven that caught the heat from the Franklin. Looking skeptical, he said, We'll need to think about that one and see how it goes. So what about windows? Um, well, there are windows, but they aren't glass. Dad said they were made of lian or something like that. He thought for a second before snorted at what he probably thought was my stupidity. Lexan, it's a kind of plastic. Yeah, that's it. The window is sandwiched between two sets of shutters. Huh? Remembering how Toddy had liked to scare me by dropping the inside shutter real fast and then catching it at the last second before it squashed me, I shook my head. There is an inside shutter that is hinged at the top of the window opening. You pull this chain, and the shutter opens toward the ceiling, and then you put the chain on the hook on the wall to keep it open. Then comes the window, and you can open it by lowering the top part into the bottom part. It lets the heat out that is rising. Mom called them a transom window and said it creates a good cross breeze. Next is the screen. Real ones, not those flimsy plastic things that tear if you swat a fly on it. And on the outside are regular-looking shutters that open and close like bifold doors. And before you ask, the door to the outside is really heavy and everything too, and has a screen door on the outside. The door opens onto a porch that is screened in to keep the mosquitoes and flies out. Sometimes they can get really bad right as the sun is going down. And that's about it. What about the inside? How many bedrooms? There isn't a real bedroom with a door and all. There's like this partition that gives it a little privacy but still lets the heat from the wood stove in. There is a clothes line wire that you can hang a curtain on if you want to. Mom did that. But Toddy and I slept on bunk beds in the opposite corner of the main room. Some of the cabins are bigger but we always reserved the same one each year. It was like Dad's tradition. Mom put up with it because it made Dad happy. Toddy didn't come with us the last time we went, because Dad made him get a job and he accidentally asked for the wrong week off. Yeah, right. Wish he was here so I could kick him. He really hurt Dad's feelings that time. After a moment, he asked, Are you set on having the same cabin, or would you be interested in one of the bigger cabins? I shrugged. I hadn't really thought about it. I guess it depends on if there is anyone else there ahead of me. And if there's not, I shrugged again. I really hadn't given it any thought, but I suppose I had better. I guess that can wait till you get there. Till I get there? He sighed. Figure of speech, Dee Dee. Now let's get some sleep. You sleep in the back, and I'll sleep in the cab. I'd prefer to sleep out here, but there's no security, and... He slapped his neck. And the bugs are getting pretty bad. Part 32. Well, we got tires for the truck and some for the trailer. Picked up a few other odds and ends, too, though I suppose it didn't seem like much compared to what Jace had decided to leave back in his village as being too cumbersome and not worth the trouble. Some of it was still nice stuff. I even sneaked a couple of snow globes into my pack that I didn't tell him about. Found one in Rochelle, too. Maybe I'll start collecting them. But to be honest, what we mostly got was depressed. Jace looked like something was eating him up from the inside out. He was lucky I was covering his back, 
or he'd been chomped on about three times. It reminded me too much of the way some of the people in the group used to act. I didn't like the wiggy feeling I was getting off of him, so I tried to start a conversation by saying, that town was another one of those refugee centers where they evacuated uninfected people to... Jace nodded grimly as he sipped some bean broth left over from the pot of beans that I'd made for supper. Yeah, he grunted. FEMA signs up all over the place. Don't you mean down all over the place? He looked at me and I could tell he was bound and determined to stay in a foul mood. This is no joking matter. It looks like they were overrun by infecteds. I shrugged. Not necessarily. I know there were quite a collection of pus brains in that place, but compared to some places I've been caught in, it wasn't all that bad. Besides in the city, at least in the early days, you were just as likely to be taken out by a riot as by a flock of puss brains. A flock? Didn't I just say... Trying to stop the runaway train that Jace's temper could turn into, I told him, I'm not making fun, Jace. It is just what we used to call them if the group of puss brains were too few to be considered a horde and too many to be a bunch or... or whatever. You know what I mean. He shook his head in disgust. Those people you hung out with messed you up. You just... Just what? I asked, not sure I wanted to know. Don't you have any... any finer sensibilities? Like a real girl? You act... completely? Totally? He shook his head again, apparently at a loss. I looked at him and said quietly, I survived. Maybe I didn't survive as the same person I was to start with. Maybe I'll never be the person I could have been. Maybe Mom and Dad and Toddy wouldn't think I was a nice girl anymore. But I survived. You don't like it, tough? I guess he realized he'd been a little harsh because he tried to backtrack by saying, Dee Dee, I didn't mean... Yeah, you did. You just can't find the right words to use to say it. Well, I don't care. I didn't ask you to babysit me. I don't need a babysitter. And I sure don't need someone to try and teach me manners or... or finer sensibilities. Or anything else that just might get me killed. But since you're so disgusted, I free you from this promise you made. Just give me my pack and... He growled and said, Okay, that's enough. You're starting to sound like a drama queen. I nearly threw my bowl at him, but he didn't notice because he was in the middle of spewing it out. Fine. I hurt your feelings. Let's not get all stupid over it. I'm tired. You're tired. This day has sucked. Rochelle was bad enough, but then Rockford, where I'd hoped to maybe see another camp or military base, was a burned-out shell. We had no choice but to drive through there the best we could, and still managed to do the one thing I didn't want to have to do. Here we are outside of yet another F, a uh, messed up hellhole, this one with too many infecteds for me to feel comfortable. But we had to stop because it is too dark for me to see to change another damn tire because of that mess in Rockford. I'm sick of this. Let's just clean up and try and get some rest. He did look kind of bad. In hindsight, maybe I should have kept my mouth shut. Don't you ever look on the bright side of things? You've got to be kidding me. There isn't a bright side to this nightmare. Sure there is, I told him. We made it across the state line only one day behind your schedule. We found the tires we needed so we don't have to dig around in this place. Beloit, or however you pronounce it. We found those two cases of water and those big cans of food in that FEMA truck. We found all those packages of condiments in that other big truck. You got some camouflage pants that are long enough, and I actually found some jeans that will fit without having to cut a yard off in the leg, but weren't little kid clothes, so they fit my butt too, which is a major bonus from a girl standpoint. All he did was roll his eyes, so I continued, and then there is some of that other junk we picked up, and it all fit in the trailer, even though you said there wouldn't be room for it. We also found some more of those clues you were going on about last night, being situationally aware to what the big picture is. 
Using those clues, we mostly figured out what probably happened to make the military pull back and abandon the town. And to top it off, you learned how to break into cars without having to break a window and make a lot of noise. Courtesy of yours, truly thank you very much. He shook his head. You are so freaking strange. Demented, even. How does that nearly worthless crap balance against all of those dead bodies? They used to be people. Real, live people. Just like my dad, Clary, Uncle Simon, Sammy, John, John. He was really getting wound up, so I told him calmly, I didn't say it balanced things out. Nothing is ever going to balance things out. But we are still better off than we were first thing this morning. It counts. It might not count for much in your eyes, but in mine, it is a heck of a lot better than most days in the city. Close to Disneyland, even. He opened his mouth to shout, but then seemed to decide not to for some reason. He just kept looking at me, then asked, It was really that bad in the city? I shrugged and responded, It was really that bad. People died every day. You had to get used to it or you'd be the next one dead. The people weren't always in your group, but someone was always dying. And not just from the pus brains. Trust me, if you don't already know, most people are animals at heart, especially guys. But girls aren't always all the way human either. Sometimes it wasn't the puss brains that were the most dangerous. Other stuff made it hard too. Food was getting really, really difficult to find. We'd heard rumors that some people were going cannibal. No one in our group but some of the inner city gangs were pretty nasty. Clean water was scarce too. Everything was getting contaminated. Then there is all the things people used to be able to go to the doctor for. Simple stuff like cuts and bangs on the head. Only now it can kill you from infections and bleeding that you can't stop quick enough. I stopped, caught up in some of my memories, then jumped when I felt him touch my shoulder. I turned to look him in the eye and said, People die, Jace. And sometimes they are the lucky ones. Part 33 we didn't talk much after that, just enough to pick up what needed picking up. I climbed into the back of the truck inside the camper top and tried to get comfortable, but wound up using my nifty night goggles that we found inside an overturned military cargo truck to write in this notebook. Then when I was finally tired, I laid down and slept. I assume Jace did something similar, but he hasn't looked too good all day today. Around midday, I asked him, Teach me to drive? I figured if I knew how to drive, he wouldn't have to do it all and could maybe get some rest. So much for my trying to be nice. He looked like he suddenly got sick to his stomach. Are you kidding? You'd need a booster seat to see over the steering wheel. I doubt you can even reach the pedals. I said I would teach you what you needed to survive, not how to kill yourself and me along with you. I could have handled it if he had been kidding, but he wasn't. He was completely serious, and I got completely hacked off. I gave him the silent treatment, but the jerk didn't seem to mind at all. I probably would have made more of a point if I had refused to cook, but since I wanted to eat, someone had to do it, and that someone seemed to be me. Sucker. As we drove along the interstate was still pretty clear, though, there were more signs of neglect the further north we went. When we hit Madison, you could say we hit what looked like the end of the world. The interstate literally just disappeared. I don't know what blew up, but it was huge. We had to turn west, and then tried to pick the interstate back up by going across that piece of land between Lake Mendota and Lake Monona, but we got halfway across, and it turned out to be the western boundary of whatever had gone boom. We backtracked again and after looking on a map, decided to just go around Madison completely by following the Loop Highway. Jeez, it was bad, really bad. We saw people, uninfected people. But I'm not sure they were still all human. They looked like the homeless people in the city during the middle of winter, after gang members had messed around with them. They scurried around pushing carts and wheelbarrows, digging through what remained of the city human cockroaches feeding off of anything they could find. It was like having a flashback of St. Louis. As bad as I felt, I could tell Jace was shook. 
I think it was the kids that did it. Shades of Sammy and John John and all that carp. It was kind of strange, but everyone ran from the truck instead of towards it like I expected. Before I could ask why, Jay said, They must have had a bad experience with people that still have vehicles. Maybe the military. Maybe gangs. I snorted. Or maybe someone is just trying to set themselves up like some kind of warlord or king. Get a load of that. I pointed to what I had seen and Jace looked ready to hurl. His knuckles were blue-white where he was gripping the steering wheel, but he kept going and never slowed down. A hand-painted sign had been nailed up near the hanging corpses that were swinging in the rancid breeze and it read, By order of the Mayor of Madison. Each corpse had a sign hung around its neck. Most of them said, Looter, though one of them said, Treason. The one that got me, though, was the one that said, Necrophilia. Jace? Does that mean what I think it means? He shuddered. Stop asking so many questions, Dee Dee, and just keep your eyes open for trouble. I took that as a yes. It's not like I don't know there are some sick people in this world. I've palled around with a few of them in the city, but there is sick, and then there is sick. It took hours to get out of Madison. We kept having to backtrack and try a different road. It was like being in a disaster movie. Whole buildings had fallen over blocking roads and making them impassable. Overpasses and bridges were just rubble like somebody had upended a bucket of Lincoln logs. Radio and cell towers were like scattered tinker toys. Eventually, though, we made it to this place called Devil's Lake State Park. We were several miles north of Madison and needed to go east to hook back into the interstate, but it was too dark to go on. Jace was frustrated and walked off to, um, water a tree, and left me to watch the truck. I guess someone had been watching us because a girl came out of the woods and said, You missed them. Everyone left last week. Part 34 it is a good thing it was me and not Jace who she snuck up on, or Sonny wouldn't have lived very long. Jace's temper isn't the only thing that is quick on the trigger. Long story short, and I absolutely refuse to write out the whole long lecture Jace gave me about stranger awareness and how angry he was at me for just striking up a conversation with someone, even if it was someone like Sonny. Sonny is a little slow in the mental department, if you don't mind my saying so. And since this is my notebook, I'll say it any way I dingity dang well please. I'm just saying it, not saying it to be hurtful or rude. I don't care if Jace did have a snit because I told him using the same words to explain Sonny seeming a little light in the IQ numbers. I wasn't being catty. I don't mean she needs to be labeled like they would have at school. I just meant that she seemed, I don't know, slow about some stuff like math, amounts, and people's personal space. Explaining in her kind of sing-songy voice, she said, They put signs up all over the place. They said if you wanted to be evacuated, then you had to get here by two weeks ago, and that the military would move us to a safe facility. Jace asked, A safe facility? What does that mean? Sonny just shrugged. I don't know. Just some place where there aren't any infected people. That's what Gran told me. Gran? Yeah, we're from Madison, but there were people here from all over. My uncle and his family had been visiting us from Detroit when things went bad. First he drove us to the FEMA camp in Rochelle, but when that place got destroyed by those people that tried to take over and be boss, we all came here. I looked at Jace to give him an I-told-you-so face about reading the clues we had found, but he wasn't paying attention. He asked Sonny, Where is everyone else? Like it was almost no big deal, she answered. I'm the only one left. They wouldn't take anyone that looked like they'd been infected. I was babysitting my niece, and she bit me and left a bruise. And when someone saw it and started screaming, they threw me off the bus. I don't mind, though. They wouldn't take Gran either because she was dying without her blood pressure medicine. She had a heart attack two days after we got here, and they put her in this place called an infirmity. When they packed everything up to go, they were just going to leave her because they said it was limited resources 
and something called triage. I don't want to be with people that are like that. I stayed here with Gran when those that weren't evacuated ran off to try and find some place else to hole up for the winter. Trying to get the rest of her story out of her, Jace carefully asked, Where's your grandmother? Again, like it wasn't a huge deal, Sonny answered. She died. I buried her the best I could. I need to find some more rocks, though. Something keeps trying to dig her up. You look big and strong. Can you help with some heavy rocks? I've got food I can trade. So, more proof that either she is blocked up mentally or blocked up emotionally. I just hope whatever it is doesn't come unblocked in the middle of a situation. Reason why I say this is because guard dog Jace caught me off guard. Jace didn't even look at me but started lecturing Sonny on talking to strangers, but he did it a lot nicer than the way he'd done the same thing to me. Apparently he is partial to playing hero to people he thinks are helpless. I think he is learning. I'm not helpless, just need a little help to get me going the right direction. And it has left a hole in his plans or in his, I don't know, in what he needs to keep his head on straight. Without even asking me, he agreed that we'd stay and help Sonny. I left him sitting by the fire with her, lecturing her about how she needs to do this, that, and the other. Got news for Jace. Sonny may be a little simple, but that doesn't mean she is stupid. She can cook just as good as I can, maybe better. Her soup was so good, not even Toddy would have complained about it. But she fell on my cornbread like she hadn't had any in a long time. Your own cooking gets old after a while, she told me when she saw me noticing how she was wolfing the bread down. And Gran never would let me do much baking. I always forget about when things need to come out of the oven, and it set the smoke alarms off a lot. Those things would make Gran's hearing aid scream, and she hated that. She also got mad about wasting food. We only lived on her social security and my SSI because she didn't like me leaving the house to work. But I used to work in the convenience store on the corner, but then they closed and they stopped the bus line that ran close to the house. I shrugged, disregarding most of what she'd said, and told her, As far as cooking, it depends on how hungry you are, I guess. This past year I've been so hungry that my own cooking was just fine for every meal. She nodded like it was an accepted fact. Out of nowhere she asked me, How old are you? Uh, fifteen, I responded cautiously. Hmm, that guy your boyfriend? Your brother? The idea was slightly nauseating. Ooh, no, to both questions. She nodded with a satisfied look on her face. Didn't think so, but it's always polite to ask first. Mind if I see if Jace wants to be my boyfriend? I shrugged, realizing that Sonny was older than she looked, at least in the experience area, and if I'm being honest, smarter about some things than me, or at least than I chose to be. Still, just because I didn't want Jace that way is no reason to throw him to the wolves. Or wolf. I told her, just be careful. He's been hurt. A lot of people he cared about have died. Even a girl he was going to marry. Oh, she said, biting her cheek, looking concerned. He's the marrying kind. That takes special handling. Gran said you didn't just fool around with guys like that. They take things real serious. Sonny made me want to laugh the way she saw things. Put the way she said it, I could see it, but I still didn't know exactly what to make of her. So I just shrugged and said, Uh, yeah, I guess so. She nodded and said, Gran was the one that told me all about men and she would know. She'd been married four times and was working on getting number five to come around before the monsters got him on the way here. She always said that a real woman needed a man by her side, even if they were a lot of work to keep up with. Well, there's not much to say to something like that. She made guys sound like a pet or an accessory or something. Suddenly, I wasn't feeling much like laughing anymore. After we all cleaned up, Sonny went to, well, whatever she is doing with Jace. It's not like I begrudge her or anything. 
I'm not looking for a boyfriend. I've got other priorities that come first. But I'm not sure that I want things to get the kind of interesting they are bound to get if Jace and Sonny... Shudder. Gotta get the pictures out of my head. Way too much TMI. Part 35 I knew it has been a while since I've written, but I hadn't really paid attention to how long until I thought about writing tonight. I took a look at my homemade calendar out to put the date and the top of the page and just about freaked. Two weeks. We've been parked in this area for two whole weeks. I was just about ready to pick up and leave on my own when Jace and Sonny stopped. Well, I'm not sure what they've been up to, and I'm pretty sure I don't want to know. Although I must admit the time hasn't been completely wasted. Jace decided he could kill two birds with one stone, figuratively anyway, and started teaching both Sonny and I those survival skills he was going to teach just me. We've been doing a little bit of everything. Fishing, orienteering, and hunting. Fishing was a no-brainer for me, and we ate fish almost every day at one or two meals. I'd catch it and clean it, and Sonny would cook it. I didn't complain. She really is a good cook. Since she seemed to be determined that she couldn't bake anything, in exchange for her teaching me how she did fish, I taught her to make cornmeal patties. They look like cornmeal pancakes so that she could have her bread without having to do any baking. She was so happy she jumped around and fell on top of Jace, who had been sitting by the fire thinking. Instead of getting mad like I thought he would, he actually laughed. Right there I started being more careful around Sonny. Jace didn't seem to notice what she was doing at the time, just looked on her being like, I kid, I guess. But I sure noticed. I'm still not sure what to think about it. I never said anything. Jace is old enough that he shouldn't need my help to figure that sort of stuff out, but it gave me the heebies. I know it sounds selfish. It did in my head, and does even more written out here on this page. But I wonder now that Jace and Sonny have hooked up. Where does that leave me? Three is a crowd in the front of a pickup truck. Mostly I've been too busy, though, to worry that much. It will be what it will be. I learned that bit of philosophical junk in the city. Besides, Jace hasn't exactly given me a lot of reason to worry, at least not so far as I can tell. Then again, for the last three nights, he said things like, You're a little too young to understand blah blah blah, and I'm thinking that Sonny has finally managed to get what she was after. They'd stay up late, sitting practically on top of each other, no matter how long I took to go get in the back end of the truck. Enough of that. No sense in worrying about what I can't change. Besides fishing and cooking, Jace has been going over our orienteering skills. I know what those are after having to listen to Toddy and his friends as they earned their Boy Scout patches. As many times as they used to take me to the park and lose me so they could find me. When they remembered to do the finding part, of course. It didn't take me long to pick up that stuff either. Knots were easy as well. Toddy and his friends used to tie me up plenty when they lost me in the park. They said it was so I wouldn't move around and really get lost, but I heard Dad give Toddy a long lecture about his meanness too often to know there wasn't more to it than that. I suppose I was too dumb of a little sister to tell Toddy no when he would get up to mischief, so Dad did what he could and taught me how to escape. That pretty much ended Toddy's reign of terror in my life. Apparently it's no fun when your victim doesn't need rescuing anymore. Then there were the hunting lessons Jace gave. Definitely more of a challenge for me, and kind of frustrating. I had down the moving around quietly and tying the right kind of knots for the traps. It was knowing where to set the traps that I had to learn. Sonny had Jace to help her every time, so she always seemed to get something. But the one time I complained about it, Jace growled at me and said that if I wanted to be self-sufficient and take care of myself, I shouldn't expect him to help me the same way he was helping Sonny, that she needed him more than I did. Maybe she does and maybe she doesn't. I haven't decided if that's true or not yet. I'm not letting it get me down, though. More like I'm using it as a learning opportunity, just like with everything else. 
I know he isn't being fair, but I didn't agree to let him get me to singing waters because he is fair. He's really good at this hunting stuff, and I need to learn. I just wish he wouldn't be so different with me than he is with her, but I really don't guess I care anyway. So long as I learn, even if it is harder to learn this way, I'm satisfied. At least he isn't like Toddy about it, and always making fun when I fail. I am pretty sure, not positive, mind you, but definitely pretty sure, that Sunny isn't as slow about learning this stuff as she acts. She can do it better. She just acts like she needs Jace, and I can see from Jace's face that in a really warped way he needs her to be that way. Nope. Sunny may not be what you call super smart, but she is clever in ways I'm not. More power to her, I suppose. I just hope I don't ever get to some place where I have to act that way to get through life. And Sunny isn't bad or anything. I read what I just wrote, and it makes her sound like a conniving and mean kind of person. But she isn't. She can actually be kind of sweet. Trust me, after dealing with the three witches back in school, I know mean and conniving. Sunny isn't that way. At least, I don't think so. If she was a little older and mouthier, she'd remind me a bit of Sherry. One of those tough on the outside but gooey on the inside kind of people. Unfortunately for Sunny, I don't think she is tough enough in the right ways. Sunny and Sherry have the same coloring, which is part of it, I suppose. And Sunny is the same kind of pretty, even though I think she is a little silly for putting on all of that makeup when it is only going to draw biting bugs, but whatever. It's her skin. There is also something similar in their attitude towards guys. I suppose there are just things I'm not ever going to understand, and one of them is girls that need guys to feel like real girls. Should probably add to that list guys that seem to only see the girls that act all limp-wristed and needy, but, oh well, that's life. Today we spent the day breaking down the last bit of the camp we've put together and getting it packed away. Apropos of nothing. I like that phrase, by the way. My sixth grade language arts teacher used to use it a lot. A couple of mornings ago, Jace suddenly announces that we were leaving and that Sonny would be coming with us. Well, I'd kind of been wondering about what Sonny was going to do, but it would still have been nice to have been asked my thoughts rather than dictated to. On the other hand, it is Jace's truck. I can't exactly pitch a fit about it, but I was also told that I'd be sleeping in the cab and that they'd be sleeping the camper from here on out. It only makes sense, Dee Dee. You're a lot shorter and won't be as cramped as I was, and this way I can be close by for Sunny. She has nightmares, you know. Uh-huh. Maybe she does, but then again. Anyway, we've spent our last couple of days bringing in all the game and fish we could smoke and dry, so we'd have meat on the road. Jace even brought in a deer, but it was small and scrawny and looked like it had been living a freaked-out life, running from puss brains and people alike. Jace said that is why it tasted kind of funny. But beggars can't be choosers. We have canned stuff, but Jace said we need to save it for when there is little to no hunting that can be done. Jace has started to say fewer you things and say more us things, which is good, I suppose, and something I have Sonny to thank for. But I look at our supplies from a cook's eye and see that what was a lot of food for one or two isn't going to be near as much for three or more if Jace picks up any more strays. I know Jace has been looking at the supplies, too. We used up most of the food that Sunny had in her camp despite piecing it out with fish and stuff. I can see that he has something on his mind. And now instead of sleeping, I'm back to wondering if what is on his mind includes me going out on my own earlier and a lot lighter than was originally planned. Part 36. Been a couple of days since I felt like writing. Got a rotten cold. Been in a rotten mood. I always get a cold this time of the year, but it's been really hard to deal with this time because apparently Sonny is a germaphobe. Who would have thought it? She seems like an otherwise practical kind of person. It has made driving three in the cab interesting. Or not depending on which end of the ew and gross you are on. It's not like I'm spewing snot all over the place. I am using a handkerchief for a pity's sake. And I wash it out every night and dry it so I can start clean the next day. I don't know what her damage is. 
During the day, I'm scrunched up on one side of the seat, and Sonny is practically riding in Jace's lap. I offered to ride in the camper, but Sonny nearly fainted at the idea of then having to sleep where my germs had been. Well, let me tell you, it didn't exactly thrill me to offer to have my germs where she and Jace have been, uh, sleeping. Ick. First night we stopped in this place called Plover. It was a little village-type place. There were still people around, but they were real standoffish and wouldn't let us get too far off the road. They set a guard on us. I could tell some of them were getting a little too interested in what was in the trailer, so I made up some story that made it seem like the stuff might be contaminated. After we got out of there early the next morning, Jace tore me a new one, shouting in the cab. You know they could have just decided to kill us or burn us out. Why would you do something so lame-brained as letting them think we were all contaminated? Trying to be reasonable even if wasn't, I told him. I didn't. A couple of them might have thought it was too big a risk, but the rest of them weren't bad people and had some common sense. They knew I was just BSing. The story saved them and us some grief having to deal with the few of their crew pushing too hard and creating a situation. Jace ground his teeth and snarled. That makes absolutely no sense. I shrugged. I knew what I knew and there was no explaining it if he didn't want to listen. Maybe it didn't make sense to you, but it worked. He snorted. This time. But you better not pull another stunt like that. You aren't the only one here to worry about. Stop being so selfish. What would Sonny do if she got hung up in something that went sour like this could have? I didn't say it, but I think Sonny would do just fine. She reminds me a bit of a cat, always landing on her feet. Needless to say, Jace wasn't happy with me for a while, then he made me angry by saying it served me right to get the cold that started to come on around lunchtime of that day. He acted like I'd done something just to put Sonny in danger, and was getting my just desserts. Then Sonny started up with her germaphobe act, and I really got a headache. I've got to admit, some of this is my fault. I wanted Jace for a guard dog but I wanted him for my own guard dog. My problem was that I also expected him to think like a people and not just a dog. I'm getting more and more certain I'm going to have to break off and make my own way at some point. I'll hold out as long as I can. The weather looks to be turning bad, and I don't want to have to walk or skate in it the rest of the way if I don't have to. Seriously bad timing for this cold anyway. It is almost the beginning of November and the days are getting cold, and the nights even colder. Last night we didn't get far at all, and stopped at this place on the map called Merrill, which was just down the road from Wausau. We are stuck there again tonight. Why? Because we finally ran into real military types. I was in the middle of disposing of a puss brain I had put out of its misery when they just sort of walked out of an alley. That was a hairy bit of explaining. Now I know how people must have felt when Dad took them in for questioning. Even if you haven't done anything wrong, you still feel a little guilty at being caught. Bottom line, though, is that they aren't going to try and stop us from doing what we planned. They say it isn't their problem if we want to freeze to death this winter. After following them back to what they called a holding area, we were taken to a building to have things explained to us and for them to ask us some questions. The guy I got stuck with reminded me of the school guidance counselor. He was someone I wasn't real fond of since Dad had let slip that Mr. Warder wasn't all that he should be after hours, and I overheard him and Mom talking about Mr. Warder getting caught in a sting operation at some lingerie shop that wasn't strictly a lingerie shop if you catch my drift. The guy even had a squeaky voice like Mr. Warder that to me was like fingernails on a chalkboard. The only thing, Miss Phillips, is that we need a record of everyone for recovery purposes down the road. Think of it like a census. We trying to ascertain how many uninfected people remain in this country and beyond, as well as how many of them are U.S. citizens. We need your name, social security number, and any potential contacts and heirs. Just cranky enough from my cold to need to act out, I told him. You've got my name. I can't remember my social security number, and all my contacts are dead, and I've never had any heirs. 
You can torture me, I suppose, but you'll wind up with the same answer. The guy, Dr. Something or Other, gave a small smile like he found me funny for some reason and said, It's not worth the effort to try and force the information out of you, Miss Phillips. Too much time and work involved when we have other things to do. Besides, I highly doubt you've got anything of that much interest for us to ponder anyway. So what if you'll give me your story, we can let that suffice for the other information and be done in just a moment or two. That is what we are doing for most of the children. I don't appreciate being lumped in with the children and was prepared to stick it to him. But I don't know how he did it. He pulled enough of my story out of me that he must have started to believe me and certainly take me more seriously. He was really scribbling, then stopped and called in a transcriptionist and some guy in a uniform. Every time we got to a name, they'd ask me some other questions. Do you happen to know what Dr. Hansen's first name is? Or any of the other doctors? Nope, not a clue. But Dr. Hansen has a daughter a little older than me named Michelle. Oh, and there was a medical doctor named Maria Ricardo that was part of Dr. Hansen's team but was actually not bad and stuck up for me in a doctor kind of way when the chips were down. Hmm. And about Major Jeffries and the other ranking officers you encountered? Look, I was only there a couple of days, and we didn't make the greatest impression on each other. I liked Sergeant Watson, but that's about it for the uniform types, except for Sheriff Barrio and his son Lee, which I guess might be in the uniform types, but not the military-type uniforms. Dr. Ricardo was all right, like I said, and then there was this young guy named Cochran, though I don't know what rank he held or if he even had a rank, but all of the rest of that bunch are pretty much a blur. They were also busy typing out all I knew of the names of the people that had been in the same group as me in the city, and the names of people I'd run across, or the names of people that I knew for a fact were dead, and how I knew they were dead. I didn't know why on earth they wanted to know or how they were going to use the information. One of them mentioned something about it going into a big national database for cross-referencing to try and prevent insurance fraud of all things. It sounded like a lot of work for a little return, but I let him ramble on. I did learn by closing my mouth and opening my ears that St. Louis wasn't supposed to be cut off the way it had been. That it had been done by a splinter group of scientists acting on their own based on some wild hair of a hypothesis they had developed. Sounds just about right with what little I know of the group that took over my town. I also found out that at some point they'd probably take my deposition and use it as part of the evidence to bring these scientists up on charges of insubordination or crimes against humanity or something along those lines. Last thing I want to get in the middle of is a long, drawn-out court battle. Dad said that they were the worst kind, and you never really knew what the outcome would be. The best cases were cut and dry with some form of justice coming swiftly. Given all that has happened, I'm beginning to wonder if there is just a thing as justice. You live the best you can. You die the best you can. What comes between the two seems to be mostly down to luck. What comes after is between you and God. Sonny and Jace had to do their own bunch of talking, but apparently not as much as me, so they were at loose ends which they spent just hanging out with some people their age. When I got cut loose after being asked a bazillion questions, most of which I could just barely answer, I tried to join them, but not being 18, I got shut out. I was too young. I've probably killed more puss brains than all of those kids put together, but that was just not good enough. It was just like being around Toddy's bunch. Some things never change. But that's why we are stuck here a second night. We are kept separate from the refugee camp. And those that aren't in the camp proper avoid us like we are contaminated. Some act like they are even scared of us. The same way they are of the uniform types. That makes me uncomfortable. I heard the way some of the guards talk about the people in the camp. It wasn't very flattering. They compare them to sheep and cattle, like they don't have too many brains or are at least not smart enough to think for themselves. 
One guy said they were so dumb that if someone told them to look up during a rainstorm, they'd drown. And the people have to work a lot too. And not on their schedule, but as they are told to. Apparently, they've been spending the spring and summer salvaging all of the food, clothing, and other things all along the interstate and in other easily accessible places that don't have too many puss brains roaming around. You don't get to volunteer to go on these salvaging trips. You get drafted whether you want to or not. And if you aren't salvaging, you are working in gardens or cleaning or doing whatever you are told to do when you are told to do it. Days off are once or twice a month rather than once or twice a week. And you don't get paid. You do this so you can earn credits. These credits are what you use at the cafeteria to eat or to go to the supply house to get clothes or shoes or soap. There's a library you can use the credits at too, but most people can barely keep up with feeding themselves and their family. Entertainment isn't real high on the priority list. Sounds like a hard life. But I suppose if all you care about is two meals a day and somebody to protect you from the puss brains that always seem to be popping up, then it isn't a bad life. All I know is I wouldn't like it. Part 37 We could have stayed. They said we could. Sonny's whining was getting on my nerves. Jace sighed. Sonny, we've been over this. I promised Dee Dee I'd get her where she was going. I owe her. She turned to me, and while pouting, she asked, Why do you want to go to some old camp away from other people anyway? Who will you talk to? Who will you live with? I sneezed into my hanky and then looked at Jace but didn't say anything. She wouldn't let me leave it alone. Well? Sighing, I told her, I'm going where I want to go. If I had stayed in the refugee camp, someone else would have always been telling me where to go and when to go and what to do when I got there. She tossed her head impatiently. Well, that's just stupid. First of all, you're just a kid, and kids always have to have people telling them what to do. Gran always said so. Second, there was food there. No tying knots or digging pits or anything like that. Just open a can or box and there you go, or better yet, stand in a cafeteria line and get waited on. And there were police and real soldiers to keep away the infecteds and the bad people. So what if you had to work or listen to someone tell you what to do? It wouldn't kill you. I sighed again and just looked out the window. Sonny, you could have stayed. I told Jace he could stay if he wanted to. Whatever is between you two is none of my business. And whatever Jace thinks he owes me is done and over with. She tried to turn to Jace, but he popped some kind of techno music CD into the truck's stereo and turned it up just loud enough to make talking difficult. Jace is getting a little annoyed with Sonny, I think, because every time she turned back to start on him again, he'd get a little crankier. Or maybe it is the driving that is making him that way. Military types wouldn't let us go any further north, said the road was completely out and that we had to turn west. Well, it was west we wanted to go to begin with, but the intel on the road we were using could have been a little better. They didn't say they hadn't really gotten around to cleaning it up yet. It took us all day, literally all of the daylight hours we had, to go 100 miles. The reason why it took so long is obvious when I consider how many times we had to get out and push cars out of our way. We off-roaded when we could, but it wasn't always possible. The other problem, though, was that HY-58 should have been called Puss Brain Alley. I'm really glad my nose is stuffed up. I've kind of gotten used to not smelling their dirty, rotting waste smell. Every one of them could likely have used several days in a rainstorm to get some of the mess off of them and clean their clothes and coverings up. It took a couple of times to get the kinks worked out of how we did things. Jace, you are the one that has been going on about having a plan before we need one. Well, this is as good a time as any to see if I can make a plan that works. So here it is. When we hit a roadblock, I'll hop out, pop the lock on the car, put it in gear while you cover me. Then I'll stand back and cover you while you push the car out of the way. Sonny stays in the truck, keeps it running, and then moves it forward as we make a space. Jace shook his head. I don't like you being so exposed. 
That isn't the way that I had meant for this to work. I shrugged a little impatiently. Jace, you want to babysit me or make sure that I have the experience necessary to stand on my own two feet? He gave me his patented Jace is getting PO'd look, but his growl didn't scare me. This is the way I lived for a whole year. At least we aren't boxed in like I've been when we were salvaging inside a building. I can do this. I've got your back. He sadly shook his head. This is supposed to be the other way around. I'm supposed to have your back. You do. I don't see the problem. We're a team. When you are a team, you work together and cover for each other. Not only one person carrying all the burden alone. He wasn't happy about it, but he turned practical, I'll give him that. But it seemed that it became doubly important to him that Sonny be taken care of. Fine. Whatever. So long as we kept moving forward, we are in some place called Bloomer of all things. Puss brains all over the place, but kind of different puss brains from the ones I'm used to. And even though I'm dying for some sleep, I had to get this day off my chest. The puss brains around here still seem to think, oh, not real deep thoughts or anything like that, as far as I can tell, but they aren't all crazy and violent like the ones I'm used to. Their hunger is driving them just like the others, but these infecteds around here, they're scared of us. Most of them are anyway. I think then they've learned to stay away from trucks and guns. Taught them to stay away from bats today, too. And no, I'm not trying to be funny or boastful. I had to put several down, and unfortunately I made the mistake of looking one or two of them in the eyes. Somebody was home. Probably not the same somebody they were before they got infected, but there was an animal intelligence in a couple of them. For instance, the cold slows them down. Doc thought it was because their metabolism slowed down, sort of the same way that reptiles slow down in the cold. But the puss brains around here, they are putting clothes on, and when they can't find more clothes to wear, they'll throw something else on them. I saw one that was wearing a tablecloth like a poncho. I'm telling you, I'm not sure what to make of it, and it bothers me. Maybe they are stuck betwixt and between. Kinda infected, kinda not. Enough of them did try to chomp on us that I'm not going to change the way I handle puss brains, but it does make my feelings hurt over having to destroy them. Makes me wonder if all puss brains are alike, or, or if there is hope for some. Probably wouldn't be many, and I don't know how to tell them apart from your run-of-the-mill puss brain. Maybe it is just too late and I need to stop worrying about it. But it is hard not to. Could there be a cure? Have I been murdering people that could be helped? Am I going to have to answer to someone at some point? What about Judgment Day? I just don't want to dream tonight. Please God, just one night without dreams. Part 38 We turned north this morning and the road is better, but not by much. We stopped outside the town of Spooner. I remember the place because Dad always stopped here, as it was the last stop before we entered the back country. We'd pick up any last-minute groceries we needed at this little cash-only grocery store. We'd gas up one last time, take one last look at civilization, and then start on the last leg of our trip to the National Forest. Dad said that Main Street and Spooner hadn't really changed since he was a boy. Bet he wouldn't say that now. Every window was either blown out or boarded over. The marquee, over what used to be a tiny theater, read, The end of the world is here. Or it would have, except for all of the missing letters. The brick buildings were chipped and cracked by what looked like bullets. There was even a truck buried cab first into the florist shop. We got into town earlier than expected. We really didn't go far on the road today, but we needed a little time to go over the entire truck and trailer, and to make sure that we were ready to get about as away from civilization as I've ever been. There are a few more stops we can make. The towns aren't much, but dots on the map. The few that had business districts of any kind were dying even before the world fell apart. All in all, it could be worse to be spending the night here. But Sunny just cannot give up her quest to make herself and us just as miserable as she can. I hate it here. Let's go back. Sonny. 
Jace, I'm scared. Shh, it's all right, I'm here. Ugh. But to be honest, I think Sunny really is scared. She's always lived in the city. She doesn't understand and doesn't like the areas we have been traveling through. These areas aren't like an organized and manicured park. She sure doesn't like the proximity of the puss brains we've seen. In general, she's freaking out. I thought she had just gotten so tired from being freaked out that she went to bed early. Until I saw Jace slide something that looked like a pill bottle into his pocket. He jumped when he saw that I had seen. She's... she's... About to wig out. Yeah, I was pretty much sensing that, I told him, and then blew my nose for the eleventy dozenth time. Jace looked like he was all prepared to defend himself, but then shook his head. I made a mistake. I thought she... I thought she was like Clary. Clary, a lightweight in the academic area? Rather than a fight about how I phrased it, he shrugged. Depended on the subject. She wasn't like Sunny. Clary was just... Sweet, defenseless, very innocent. Which isn't what Sonny is. I mean, I'm not saying she isn't nice, but... He looked at me from the corner of his eye and nodded. Yeah. Yeah, that pretty much covers it, he sighed. I couldn't have left her, but... Damn. I've got myself in a real mess now, and dragged you and Sonny along for the ride. Whoa, Jace. No one dragged me any place. I'm heading the direction I want to go. Whatever you decide to do about Sonny... Well, that's your business and between you and her. Don't take this the wrong way, but I'm not being pulled into something like that. No, that's not what I mean. Well, then just... Just get me close to where I mean to go, leave me a few supplies to get me started, and then head on out and... I don't know. Take her back to that refugee camp she seems to want to stay at so bad. That's what she wants me to do. But I promised you. You've already delivered. To be honest, I've been wondering if we'd get this far together. I kinda got the feeling you weren't exactly expecting to hang out over the winter. He turned troubled eyes to me. I'm not sure what I was thinking. I'm starting to think now, maybe clearer than I have in a while, and I'm thinking I, I must be nuts or something. Geez, you're just a kid, really. I keep forgetting how young you are because of the stuff that comes out of your mouth. He shook his head. You can't stay up in the wilderness by yourself, no matter how many lessons I give you. You're not just a kid, you're a girl. I sighed. Let's not start that again. I don't need a babysitter, Jace. It was nice to get a ride. It was great how you've been teaching me stuff, and I appreciate it. But I never figured this was going to be a permanent arrangement. Surprised, he asked. You didn't? Aren't you scared? Kinda, I guess. I'm not sure. I might get that way. Depends on what I find when I finally get to singing waters. It's not like I haven't been scared before. As long as you don't let it take over... Fear isn't necessarily a bad thing. Dad used to say that fear was a powerful motivator. Jace nodded. Let me... Let me think about this. I can't just leave you here alone. But I can't take being shut up all winter with Sunny, either. She'll drive us both crazy. Maybe. Or maybe she just needs time to get used to things. Some people don't do well with sudden or fast change. Give her some time and she might come around. He shook his head. There isn't much time to give her. Can't you smell it, feel it? There's snow coming down someplace close by. We'll see it on the ground pretty soon. Wish I had tire chains. If wishes were horses, I forget the rest of that. Jace shook his head. Let's check over the truck one more time. If we finish with that, maybe we can see what is left in these buildings. Probably not much, but it's worth a shot. And it was, two to be exact. Jace put down one puss brain and Sonny another one. I didn't tell them so, but I put down three in back of the old theater with my bat. Sonny was already hyperventilating. There was no need for me to make it worse. 
Jace noticed the fresh blood on the bat but didn't say anything then or later. Now we are all tucked up and relatively safe. I'm eager for tomorrow. Soon, sooner than soon. I'll finally know if my dream is still there or not. Part 40 I still don't know how to write all this down. It has been weeks. Longer than that, maybe, since I've written anything down. Actually, I know it has been longer than weeks. I just don't know how much longer. Days go by and they all seem the same. This is better than being in the city, but kinda of harder, too. Okay, not kinda. It has been harder. I, I don't know what made me get the itch to pick up this notebook. Boredom more than likely, but once I picked it up I couldn't seem to put it down. It's like if I write down what has happened I can accept it. I know I have to, but it has just been one thing right after another. I guess the only way to really get through this is to just do it. Even if it does make me cry, who is going to care? I don't know why I'm even bothering. But maybe journaling it all out is best after all. For a long time now I've tried not to feel anything at all. Then suddenly I woke up and realized I wasn't just not feeling. I was forgetting how to feel. I know that is not good. If I forget how to feel it won't just be the bad stuff. I'm forgetting how the good stuff feels too. I'm forgetting that there has been good stuff in my life. I'm getting as frozen as the land around me has been. I'm not even sure what the day or date is. Like Mr. Svensson would say, the stars aren't out to guide me, need to make a wind and blow the clouds out of the way. It all started in Spooner, I guess. Or maybe it was Plumer where Sunny started thinking about what she was missing or dissatisfied with what she'd got into or something. Or maybe it started when Jace started to realize he'd bit off a lot. Or that jumping into bed for comfort or to be comforted by Sunny was a mistake. Or maybe for Jace it started long before that. Yeah, for Jace it started way before that. All I do know is that Spooner, such as it was, was the last bit of peace I've had for a while. And this beginning stuff is hard, and I've got a trap line to walk. I'm going to have to write some more on this some other time. Part 41, Spooner, Wisconsin, Main Street, USA. The end of the beginning, or the beginning of the end, or some other stupid way of saying it, marked a bad spot in the road. I'm not thinking too clearly. Late season blizzard is roaring outside, and I can hardly hear myself think. I think this is a blizzard. Maybe it is just a storm. Maybe it isn't late season and the snow keeps going and going and going. Enough! The whole point of writing this out is to get control of the bugs crawling around in my head, not give them free rein. Spooner, that's where we spent the night. We salvaged a few odds and ends from the town, but not much. There wasn't that much left to salvage, certainly no food items. But we did find makeup, and Sunny had a fit and a bunch of fun, picking out what she wanted to take. I started to remind her that Jace had said we had to be choosy because we were running heavy as it was. That's all right, Jace said over the top of me. Just remember, Sonny, take off all the packaging. Why? Patiently, he explained to her, so that it fits in the smallest space possible. Thinking about it, I saw the light bulb go on when she figured it out. Oh, sure thing, Jace. And then Sunny was finally Sunny once again. I went back to looking for anything useful in the back of the drugstore, but looked up when Jace took my elbow and pulled me out back into the alley. I asked, What? He inhaled like he was going to say something, then stopped, shook his head, and then started again. Thanks. For what? For not making a scene. I, I know, I just couldn't handle Sonny pouting and throwing a fit again today. I shrugged. She isn't a kid. You can't count on this working every time like it would with a kid. Carefully I looked at him and reminded him, She isn't your Clary, and she isn't Sammy either. She's shook up, but she strikes me as someone that could be all right if she has, you know, Structure. Maybe. Then he reached into his pocket and pulled out a small plastic store bag. Here. I took it gingerly and then looked inside. Why? I asked him. 
He shrugged. I know you don't wear war paint, but I don't know. I figured this. Look, you need some anyway. Sonny picked that moment to come find us. She saw the two of us and asked suspiciously, What's going on? I reached into the bag and pulled out a handful of an expensive brand of lip gloss and chapstick. I held them up for Sonny to see and said, Lecture time. When she looked only halfway relieved, I asked her, Did that lipstick you pick up have UV protection in it? Jace said, Unless I want to look like I've been sucking on a lemon for three years, I better start using this stuff. Then Sonny got all puffed up and said, He's right, and we should make sure you have something for your hair. You are starting to look like you are wearing a rat's nest on your head. And your skin, you aren't broke out, but you are dried out and are starting to get chapped and scaly looking. As Sonny dragged me back into the store, Jace gave me a grateful look for my bit of misdirection. Yeah, it was a lie. I know it. Part of me is sorry for it, but I also admit that a good part of me is not. Especially in hindsight. After about an hour, Jay said we needed to get going. The frost had melted, and we were very close to being overloaded. The only good thing about running heavy is that the end was less likely to blow us off the road. Sonny looked back at the rest of the stores along Main Street regretfully, like she would have really liked to have stayed and continued to explore. But she did get into the truck. She did ask to sit by the window instead of next to Jace. Jace, looking worried, asked her, You okay, Sonny? She nodded. Yeah, just want a little fresh air and that bump thing in the middle keeps hitting my knee. You should have said something earlier. We would have made sure... Sonny shook her head. No, I'm fine. I just have cramps. Jace colored up at that and let it go really fast. I gave her a knowing girl look. Makeup wasn't the only thing that Sonny had been salvaging for in the drugstore, and we agreed to split what we did find between us. It looked like it was going to be a better day. Little did any of us know. Part 42 Road is clear. Not even a wreck on the side of the road, I observed as we drove slowly along. Yeah, that's... Jace's voice trailed off. That's what? Strange. It just looks like everyone stayed home. Like a Sunday morning. I snorted. Not where I come from. The only reason you didn't go to church on Sunday morning was if you were making funeral plans. Preferably your own. I decided to exercise some of the mental muscles he'd been wanting me to build. How's this as a hypothesis? We are up here in an area where people would have tried to evacuate to if there had been something bad happen. What if the people that were already here just decided to stay put, not go out on the road? Jace thought about it and then looked at Sonny briefly before saying, Sounds plausible. Most of the little places up this way are rentals or second homes. Maybe the people that would normally been up this way couldn't make it or they were evacuated before they could get here. Everyone, keep your eyes out. If there are still people home up here, they might not want strangers to come visiting uninvited. We hadn't gone far when Sonny said, We need to stop. Why? What did you see? Huh? I looked at Jace, but he still had the blank look of a clueless guy. Finally, I had to jab him in the ribs and give him the look. Oh, oh, uh, uh, yeah. He paused and asked, Right now? Sonny shrugged and said, A girl has needs. Jace's face flamed again, for some reason reminding me of Lee more than he ever had. All the girls in school knew that Lee was very easy to embarrass. All they had to do was raise female personal hygiene issues, and he would practically run or puddle if he couldn't get away fast enough. We had only gone about twenty miles, and were at this little place called Stone Lake. Sign said there were approximately seven hundred year-round residents, so when I say little, I mean it was little. But as we got out of the truck, I would have said it felt more like a population of zero. It wasn't, but it felt that way. 
We gave Sunny some privacy to take care of herself at a pit toilet near the lake. She came out and we debated looking through some of the homes that we could see on the hillsides surrounding the lake. They looked like nice places. Many of them looked like wood chalets. Jace sighed. I'd like to, but it looks like snow. We need to get as far as we can. I don't want to get snowed in while we are still on the road. I looked at Jace. Snowed in? You mean we could get stuck someplace before we get to singing waters? He nodded. That's exactly what I mean. Let's get in the truck. He turned to Sonny and asked with a squeak in his voice, You okay to go? She nodded. Geez, it's just girl stuff. Don't flip a switch. Let's go. Now that I'm out of that smelly outhouse, I can even smell the snow on the wind. Can't you? I couldn't, but Jace nodded like he knew exactly what she was talking about. As a matter of fact, I still couldn't smell anything. If I had... If I only had. Part 43 We got into the truck and Jace said, Buckle up! He had no sooner put the truck in gear than there was a crash on the passenger glass window, and a hand tried to reach in and grab Sonny. We all yelled, or I thought we'd all yelled. Jace floored the gas and we were slipping and sliding around only to discover we were surrounded. I screamed, Just run over them, Jace. Just run over them and get out of here before they pile on the trailer. What do you think I'm trying to do? We started bouncing around up the road away from the lake, and I could feel the trailer pulling us this way and that, though I didn't know what it was at the time. I could see that Jace was really struggling with the steering wheel, struggling to keep the puss brains from holding onto the hood and other parts of the truck and trailer. Find me a hole, Dee Dee, he yelled. I looked and then pointed as a small gap in the horde opened up. We were finally free of them. It was still two or three miles before the last puss brain let go and fell off. Jace actually had to shoot the last one off as it tried to come in his side window. Cold air filled the cab. The truck was shuddering. Jace was shuddering. I was shuddering. And so was Sonny. Are you okay? Sonny was turned away from me. I thought she was just scared or something. I repeated the question and then pulled slightly on her shoulder. She fell backwards toward me. Her eye was wide and staring. What I had thought was shuddering was actually some kind of seizure. A sliver of sharp wood had been thrust into her right eye by the first puss brain that attacked us. I was having a hard time believing what I was seeing for a lot of reasons, but primarily because the puss brains had become smart enough in a group or the one that had attacked the window wasn't so far gone, that a tool was used. I'd never seen anything like it, and I'd seen a lot of puss brains. If that was the norm, all of a sudden we were in some serious trouble. Jace glanced to his right, looked back through the windshield, then jerked his head back to the right and stared horrified. Jace, look out! Watch the road! We hit a bad place in the road, and that pulled Jace's attention back to the road. He hunched around the steering wheel and drove like a flock of demons was after him, while I did what little I could. I knew all I could do was stop the bleeding and hold her hand until Jace found a safe place to pull into. Part 44 There were no good places to pull off. Trust me, we both looked. All we could do was keep driving. We did stop long enough for me to jump out and get plastic and duct tape to try and do something about the freezing cold air coming in the windows. I jumped back in the cab, and Jace was holding Sonny and muttering to her. I couldn't understand what he was saying. I should have tried to do something more for him, for both of them. But I was too busy trying to get the repairs done quickly so we could keep going. She's not dead, Jace, I told him when he finally put the truck in gear again. Not yet, he answered in a papery voice. Maybe not at all. I don't know yet. There wasn't that much blood. The... The wood thing even just fell out on its own. The wound will need to be cleaned out, but I can't do that yet. Her pulse is jumping all over the place, but it is still there. I... I think this is shock, or something. I've got her bundled up the best I can. We just need to find some place we can stop. Until then, just drive.
Like I wrote, though, there weren't any good places to stop. Two hours later, two agonizing hours, we finally pulled into Ojibwa State Park. It was a little place that straddled a small piece of HY-70, right at the Chippewa River. Jace pulled right up to the Welcome Center, and after we checked the place out, and I broke us in by crawling through a small window in the staff restroom. We carefully got Sunny out of the truck and laid her in front of a wood stove. Jace jumped and nearly hysterical yelled, Damn it, there's no wood! As calmly as I could, I told him, Yes, there is. There is a lean-to out back. I saw it just a minute ago. Doc, and I hadn't thought of him in a while, though I suppose his inadvertent lessons will always be with me to some extent, had always said that being calm was sometimes the best medicine you could give someone. After getting Sonny out of the truck and really looking at the wound, I had become convinced there was nothing I could do for her. What I had originally thought were tears of pain weren't. It was some kind of fluid leaking from behind the eye socket. I won't go into the gross parts. Suffice it to say that I had to clean the ruined and dead tissue out to prevent infection. I don't know if I was being calm or cold. What I do remember is being less concerned that Sonny was going to die and more concerned about whether or not she was infected and wouldn't. I had no idea what kind of goo, if any, had been on the wood that had been used by the puss brain. After bringing in a pile of wood and getting the fire going, Jace all but collapsed. It reminded me of how he was after Sammy and John John died. As minutes turned into hours and the day faded away, I became more worried about him than about Sonny. It's my fault, he mumbled. Those were the first words he'd spoken since he'd gone looking for the firewood. No, it's not, I told him, offering what little comfort I could come up with. Yeah, yeah, it is. Everyone that I promised to look after dies. I'm not dead, I reminded him. For how long? Nothing I could say after that could induce him to speak again. He refused to eat the soup I fixed. I had to keep draping a blanket around his shoulders to ward off the cold that was seeping in. If you took more than a few steps away from the stove, you could see your breath. I couldn't sleep. I was too wired. I'd also found a stash of colas and had warmed one up to drink. Caffeine. And memories of my mom doing this flooded my brain and kept me occupied on something beside the silent lump that Jace had turned into. About midnight, Jace finally sat up and said, You know, you're right. You aren't dead. I blinked at him more and more worried at how he was acting. No kidding, I told him, wondering what was going on. But then he started acting more normalish. I... I've taught you almost everything I know. Now it is just a matter of practice. Not everything. You still said I've got more work at navigating by the stars, and my trap placement needs some serious work. You also said you were going to teach me how to fish with a basket. That's nothing, he said with a more optimistic shrug than I'd seen in a while. Practice and a halfway decent book will make sure you get that down. You can learn this stuff from books? Sure, he said. He wasn't grinning, but he wasn't grimacing either. He was tucking a blanket more firmly around Sunny and brushing the hair off her face. What else could either one of us do? Death was a fact of life, even before puss brains became the top predator in the world. I was just glad to see he was trying to accept reality and not off in La La Land. When he spoke again, he said, I thought you said your brother was a Boy Scout. They have all of these manuals for that sort of stuff. Yeah, I know, but my brother's troop always had real people come in and demonstrate or teach them so that they could sign off on the paperwork for the badge. Or they would go to camp and learn from an older scout. That sort of thing. Look, it isn't that hard, he said, getting up and walking over to a display case of books. Using a small pen light, he looked at their spines and then grabbed a few and brought them back. He also snagged something from behind the register. He tossed the books in my lap and then took the something, which turned out to be a package of cocoa, and poured it and some hot water I had in our kettle out of habit into a mug. 
Open that one up that is on top, see? All sorts of instructions for constellations and how to identify and use them. And two of those books are on backcountry hiking and camping skills. What I haven't covered should be in those books. You don't need to overthink stuff. You just need to make sure that you pre-think stuff. Pre-think? I asked as I sipped his peace offering of cocoa. Yeah, like having a plan before you need one. He sat down beside Sonny again, but reached back and pulled a pillow off the bench there and threw it to me. I put it between my back and the wooden column I was leaning against and got a little more comfortable. Then Jace continued, Some people survive because of dumb luck, but not as many as the movies make it out to be. And then you have a few people that are uber-survivalists that can survive just about anywhere you drop them into. <laughs> but mostly, survival isn't about the equipment you have so much as the equipment you already have, he said, tapping his forehead. Pre-think something before you put your foot in it. Rephrasing what he said, I told him, think before you act. Exactly. But don't think something to death either. Think, then use what you know and get it done. Trying to gather too many supplies or make a different plan for every situation imaginable is just as much a recipe for disaster as not thinking at all. Keep a basic pack with you at all times, even just walking around camp. Then when something happens, you'll have the basic skills and basic equipment to formulate a plan through quick thinking. Got it? I yawned. Yeah, I think so. I leaned forward to put another log on the fire, but he stopped me and said, I'll do it. Why don't you take a break, or at least zone for a while? I'll... I'll take care of Sonny. It's the least I can do. Don't, Chase. Don't make this about you. Or me. It just is. Bad things happen. And sometimes... Sometimes people leave our lives. It isn't a matter of fault or blame or anything. It just is the way it is. He looked at me for a long time before nodding. I can see why you would think like that. Part of me is glad you do. We were quiet for a few more moments and I started to slide deeper into my coat. Get some rest, Dee Dee. You're going to need it. Tomorrow you learn to drive. That woke me up. I sat up and asked, Seriously? Yeah, seriously. I should have taught you before now. I just didn't want to admit that. That what? Nothing, just get some rest. I'll take care of Sonny. You sure? Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. I hadn't meant to sleep. It wasn't till later that I realized why I had suddenly gotten so tired when I had been so wired just moments earlier. Part 45. I was freezing. I mean, really, really freezing. The end of my nose felt like an ice cube. When I rubbed it, it hurt, close to frostbite. Then something penetrated and I jumped awake. Jace, we let the fire go out. My next thought was of Sunny and what the cold might have done to her. I turned, expecting to see her corpse and Jace watching her, in a catatonic state like he had been after Sammy. But there was no Sunny, and there was no Jace. I called frantically, Jace! Then I remembered to turn the voice down in case there were puss brains around. The first thing I thought, of course, was that Sonny had been infected. Like Dad would have said, I wasn't running on all cylinders. I couldn't figure out if she'd been infected, how she'd been so quiet about getting away. Then I worried that if she had been infected somehow, she'd gotten Jace, or maybe Jace had figured out what was going on and had gotten her out of the building to try and save me. Again, though, I couldn't figure out how it had happened, but I wasn't ready to discount anything since the puss brains up here had been acting different than the ones that I had run into in the city. I was almost dizzy when I stood up. Between fatigue and cold, it was a real job to get out from under the covers that someone, presumably Jace, had wrapped me in and that fact went into the basket of things I was currently not understanding. I stumbled towards the door, juggling my bat and taking the gloves out of my pocket and putting them on. I stopped myself from just charging outside. I gently pulled back the heavy drapes that covered the front windows. 
The light was incredibly bright, partly because the sun was reflecting off of the snow that covered the ground. The snow was no longer a light dusting. There was a good six to eight inches of the white stuff everywhere I looked. It was piled even deeper in a couple of places, which meant that it must have blown as well as just come down. And from the porch and moving around the front of the truck was what could only have been drag marks. There were no other marks, just that one continuous drag that looked like what was left behind when Toddy would pull me along on our snow saucer. It was easier for him to pull me along than for him to wait for me to try and keep up. It was one of the few win-win situations which entailed work that he didn't complain about. He would still dump me in the snow or send me down before I was ready when we got to the top of the hill. But even that was more of a joke we would both laugh at than real meanness on his part. I shook my head then to clear the cobweb of memories out, and I've found myself having to do the same thing again now. Transcribing what happened then, it is like draining a festering sore. I know it needs to be done, but it is gross and more than a little painful, reminding me over and over how I got the wound to begin with. Rather than exiting the front door, I ran to the back employee area and looked out the windows there. No tracks. Ran to a window on either side and no tracks there either. Finally, I decided whatever the action was had only happened on the front porch and moved away. I carefully exited and used whatever I could to hide me the best I could as I moved forward. The most confusing of all the clues I was gathering was seeing Jace's coat hung neatly on the driver's side mirror. That made less sense than all the rest of it put together. It was freezing, Peter, outside, in the teens or low twenties at the most. I looked around, but nothing was clearing the mystery up. The snow next to the welcome center was pristine white, as was the track, whatever caused it. But as I cautiously followed it along, I realized that a slight pink tinge began to show in places. Drawing on my experience growing up with a brother that wasn't afraid to wrestle in the snow, as well as what I'd seen in the city, I quickly came to the conclusion that that particular pink on white could only come from red. In other words, blood. There wasn't a lot of it, but I could tell that it was smeared rather than drops. The pink became darker and more distinct the further along the trail I followed. I looked around and realized the trail was heading towards a boat ramp. What the heck? There wasn't a lot of cover between where I was and where the trail ended, nor was the snow deep enough to hide something people-sized. There were trees but no tracks toward them or away from them, just the drag mark I was following. At the top of the boat ramp was a boulder just big enough to dent a boat trailer and just small enough to hide in a driver's blind spot. Based on all the scrapes on it, I surmised I wasn't the only person to have ever noticed what a pain the boulder likely was. But for the moment, the only thing I cared about was what was sitting on top of the boulder. Just to make sure it wasn't a trap, I inched my way over carefully. Back in the sitting, some of the gangs would bait traps in the same way. I moved the rock holding the pile of stuff down just enough to pull out the paper and started to read. Part 46 Dee Dee, by the time you get this, it will be too late. Dumb way to start a note like this, but it's true. There's no way you can stop this or me. No way I'm going to let you stop me. I drugged the cocoa. You'll be upset about that for a while, but you'll see that it was best. Sonny died. You knew she would regardless of what you said. I knew she was going to die too. It was just a matter of time. Being dead isn't the bad part. It's the suffering to get there that I hate. She had one last seizure before she finally gave up. It was bad. I held her until she died, and the look on her face was like she was grateful that it was finally over. Just picture my face looking the same way. Things have been wrong for so long, ever since Clary died. I know I wouldn't talk to you about her much, but that is because it was sacred. You could never have understood Clary without having met her. Poor Clary. And it was my fault. I was trying to force her to be someone she wasn't. She was so scared that morning, and I made her watch the truck anyway and walked away to try and do some hunting. By the time I came back, it was too late. 
She didn't get a big dose, so it took her a while to really show the symptoms, but she knew they were coming. And the pain! She knew by the pain what was coming, too. In the end, I took care of her death and burial better than I ever took care of her while she was alive. I wasn't good enough for Clary, and no matter how I've tried to redeem myself since I'm still not good enough. Uncle Simon, Sammy, John John, they all died when they shouldn't have. They wouldn't have died if I had just figured out what was going on. At the very least, Sammy and John John would have still been here if I'd done what I said I was going to, what had felt like the right thing to do at the time. Burn down that damn house. But I didn't. I wasn't strong enough or smart enough, and Sammy, half-crazy Sammy, managed to fool me. Now, Sonny. I had a third chance, and I still failed. And not just because I couldn't teach her what she needed to know, but I failed Clary by jumping into bed with a girl I barely knew and who probably barely knew what she was doing herself. They all suffered, every one of them. And now there's you. You're not dead. Not yet. But I've given it some thought, and the only reason you aren't is because you never really needed me to begin with. You could have learned what I taught you from anyone. You already know how to fish. Like I said, the rest will come to you with practice. I have a confession. I didn't teach you to drive because I wondered if I did. Would you simply take off one day and not look back? I know you aren't like that. At least now I do. But in the beginning I wondered and worried. That's my one regret. But it isn't rocket science and the truck isn't automatic. Just take it nice and slow and you'll be fine. With November finally here with the snow, the puss brains will be too slow to hassle you much. You'll do fine. And now I'm going to go do what I probably should have done a long time ago. But this water and the cold will suit me better. I've heard drowning isn't a bad way to go after you put your mind to it. And the cold will sap my will to fight the inevitable pretty quickly. The current is still running good in the middle of the river here, even if the shore is freezing up a bit. The snow has shredded Sunny's clothes and her skin, but she isn't feeling it any longer. But I'm going to take her with me. I don't want to leave you to bury her with the ground all frozen. I can at least do that. I know you are probably going to think I'm a jerk, and I know in a way I'm breaking my promise to you. But it can't be helped, and I really don't care anymore. I can't, won't, go on this way another moment. My mind is made up and it is time to leave this hell of a life I've been living. Jace, Part 47, I remember feeling empty. A feeling that hasn't left me yet. Not completely. I carefully folded the note and stuck it in my pocket. And it stayed there for a long time. Until this morning, in fact. I don't know what I was holding on to it for. But when I needed something to light the fire in the wood chips so I could cure the next round of meat, I pulled it out, twisted it, and it worked just as good as a twist of Mr. Svensson's collection of trail maps he had collected for toilet paper. Now there's a man who personifies the idea of having a plan before you need one. The rest of the stuff on the boulder was their clothes, Sonny's and Jace's. I just stood there looking at the pile. I'm sure he expected me to just pick them up and put them in the supplies in the truck, but I didn't. For all I know, they are still sitting right there on that big rock. Or maybe someone who needed them took them. Right now, I don't even care if it was a puss brain that did it. There was no way I was just going to calmly gather their clothes and keep going. I turned my back on the water. I knew I'd never find any sign of them. Doc explained to me about suicides after we had a couple in our group during the early days. He said that most suicide attempts were just calls for help. Those types usually made a way out for themselves or had a lifeline like someone who would rescue them or stop them just in time. But there was a small group of suicides that meant to do exactly what they were doing and were in fact so determined that they made sure that there was no way out for them. I'm not explaining it right or with much compassion, I'm sure. It just still makes me angry. I never figured Jace would do what he did. Oh, I worried, but at the worst I thought he'd be the cry-for-help type. But even that barely crossed my mind. 
especially after Sonny came along and gave him someone to really take care of again. Some people are like that. They need to take care of someone else, even if it doesn't make for a very healthy relationship. I don't know why that is, just that it is. I also don't know why I turned into someone that doesn't want someone else taking care of me. I used to be that way. I never wanted to leave Dad or Mom. But I was a child then. I guess I lost whatever that means. I'm not all that much older now, but Dad and Mom seem so far away, and then I learned I couldn't count on anyone to stay. Eventually, everyone leaves, even if they don't mean to. What has been the hardest to accept, a connection I'd barely wanted to admit to myself, was that both Jace and I knew how it felt to have everyone leave us. What I'll never understand is why, knowing how much that hurt, he had to just pick up and leave me with nothing but a note that didn't answer a blasted thing. I know I'm not much, but I can be a really good friend. I never would have left him in the lurch, never left him to suffer life as a puss brain, never just chosen to leave like nothing else mattered. Yeah, that's the part that has hurt the most. I've learned to live with it like I've learned to live with everything else. But I'll never understand it. Never. And I'll never say that it was okay what he did. Everyone eventually leaves. That's a fact that can't be changed. Part 48 It was when I put my foot on the bottom step to walk back into the welcome center that I connected what he had said the previous night with what he'd said in his going away letter. You need your rest. You'll be learning to drive tomorrow. He hadn't said, I'll teach you tomorrow. Why hadn't I noticed how he'd phrased it? How stupid could I be? How did I miss all the obvious signs? I thought more than once that he acted like some of the troubled people in the group I was part of in the city. I just assumed, geez, what is that old saying about assuming anything? Well, I certainly felt like a backside for a while. That's one of the reasons I decided to stop feeling anything. It was certainly less painful. I suppose hindsight is twenty twentieths, but I could see his suicide wasn't a spur-of-the-moment thing, or at least didn't appear so. I wondered how long he had been planning it. Had Sonny interrupted his plans and confused them for a while? Was that the reason from suddenly changing from the you to the us? I still don't have the answers to these questions. I've mostly stopped asking them. Does that make me a bad person? That morning, though, I was asking those questions over and over again in my head. It was like a ghosted audio feed that was hidden beneath a television show I was watching. Added to that was a sudden fear that I hadn't ever really felt before. For the first time, I was well and truly alone. I'd had Sherry before I had even known about the loss of Mom and Dad and Toddy. Then there had been Moses and Doc and all the rest of them such as they were. Some of them might have been creeps, but they were still people. I'd been briefly alone between the city and home, but I was in familiar territory, and it wasn't dangerously cold. Before I had even gotten home, there'd been Sergeant Watson, and soon after that, Lee and the Sher Hariff and even Dr. Ponytail had been somewhat on my side. But out here, there was no one. Dead silence, both figurative and literal, pounded against my ears. I turned back toward the river. I can admit it now, but not then. For maybe half a second I thought about taking the easy way out and joining Jace. But then I thought of meeting up with Dad and Mom and even Toddy in the up above, and the thought of trying to explain myself shredded the other thought into nothingness. I did go over to Jace's jacket and rummage through the pockets. Sure enough, the key for the truck was there in his inside pocket where I'd always seen him put it. I almost threw his jacket on the ground like it, and he meant nothing to me, but then stopped. Not because I was being sentimental, but because it was heavy and warm and would help with the cold, where the side windows were broken. My first act of separating my emotions from my rational brain. The one thing I did that might be said to be spiteful was that I threw that bag of makeup that Sonny had collected into the trash bin. If anyone wanted it, they could fish it out. I didn't want to have anything to do with it. I'm still not sure what I had against it. Just made me mad for some reason. 
Then I pulled the gas cans out of the back of the truck and filled the gas tank with the last of the fuel. I knew that there was no more where that came from. I would have to make it with what I had left one way or the other. Knowing that motivated me to stop, get a hold of myself, and prepare to move on. I'd been left once again. Now I was all I had left, and God. But at the time, he was a distant concept I associated with Sunday school parties and mandatory holiday services. When I thought of God, it was that he was up in heaven sitting on his throne and pretty uninterested in the stupid humans he'd get created and become disappointed in. On that day, I'd never felt more alone in my life. I've learned since then that I didn't know what really being alone meant. If I had known then what I know now, I don't think I could have continued. Or maybe it's would have. I'm not sure. I've come nearer to death on several occasions than I ever came in the city, some of those times through inadvertent kindness. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that had I known then what I know now, I would have simply shut down, sat down right on that porch, and given up. But I didn't know, so I didn't just sit down. Instead, I kept putting one foot in front of the other, somehow determined to survive what felt like a betrayal. I put the empty cans back in the trailer. I don't know why, I just did, and went inside to wipe my hands where some gas has splashed. I still couldn't smell much, but I could smell the gas, so it gave me hope that my sinuses were clearing up. I grabbed a box of tissue from behind the information desk, looked at what I was doing, then decided to look around the center more to see if there was anything else that might be worth the trouble. Because if I was out of fuel, it was less than likely that I'd be traveling this way again. Not to mention, I was not all that eager for my first driving experience to be in snow. In the staff area, I found and pulled out all of the paper products and cleaning supplies. There was also a big first aid kit on the wall that I emptied, and another portable one in a supply cabinet that looked like something that Doc would have given an organ to have. Next were the books that Jace had tossed in my lap the night before, and I took a few more besides that. Opening what I thought was a janitor's closet, I discovered where they kept all the extras of things that were out on the shelves to sell.